What's going on, everybody? And welcome back to episode 140. I've lost count. What are we Seven. at? Are we at 47? 147. 147. We are flying. We're almost at 150 episodes. How crazy is that? I know. I, I know. didn't it's realize. Crazy. I mean, we've recorded a couple episodes ahead. I didn't realize, like, the next time we record after this is going to be 150. That's insane. How you doing, bud? We're flying. I'm doing well. Coming off a U.S. saving. Yeah. The scraping by. Awful performance. We'll take if, it. If that, if that performance is away at El Salvador, it's one thing. But it's at home. And we'll talk about it. Because today is a U.S. men's national team themed episode we're going to relate it back to mls we're going to talk about this most recent nation league window um we're going to talk about how we feel about the league having so many players called in to international team duty 90 in this most recent window which has to be a record i'm sure and then we're going to talk about what it means for roster rules so we'll tie it all back together in the realm of MLS and we'll we'll share our thoughts. Now I'm not gonna not gonna go crazy here. I'm gonna try and keep this under four hours so some of us can get some sleep tonight. Before we do any of that, of course, Connor, you know what time it is. Nine fifty four. Nine fifty four. That is a perfect time to talk about scarf of the week. I unfortunately Fortunately, don't have a USA scarf. How? But the closest We're thing I've got is a fifty episodes in. How do you not have one by now? That's because the scarves are always like thirty plus dollars, and I just you work oh, a big boy job. You should spend be able to afford that. I don't want to. <laughs> Look at the but commitment to maybe, the podcast. Maybe. Uh, so I brought out my. It's a red, white, and blue scarf. It works. It's a really nice Chicago scarf. I have I like to say. It. I like it. I'll give you a pass because I like the scarf. I myself, as we are mixing USMNT and MLS, have brought out my mix of USMNT and MLS. My One Nation. One team. And I like this scarf because it shows there are only two teams that matter. It's the U.S. men's national team and the New York Red Bulls. That's why we love it. Connor, I want to I wanna get your thoughts on, on this window. We kind of were alluding to it earlier, but talk to me about how you feel this window went. We had a 7-1 victory over Granada, or 7 nothing. I think 7-1's right. I thought it was 7-1. I thought we conceded one. Yep. Yeah, 7-1, seven, seven, and then 1-0 to El Salvador just a few minutes ago we finished. What are your thoughts? I don't think it was really anything new, honestly. Kind of the same from us. You came in, you expected us to come in and blow out Granada. That's what we did. Uh, and then you knew El Salvador was going to be a tough one because they did exactly what you expected them to do. They bunkered down. 11 guys behind the ball it was be really tough to break them down. And we were super sloppy in the first half. But at the end of the day, we got six points out of the window. And I just, I don't know how you can complain too much when you're getting six points out of the window. I agree with you. I think, I think the, the results on paper are great. We talk about how you need to handle teams like Granada the way that we did. I mean, the, the two games that we've had since June, I think it was June 22 and then this one here, 12-1 aggregate score. That's how that game is supposed to go. That's not supposed to be a sweat it out and see what happens. That's how that game is supposed to go. El Salvador away ended 1-1. And El Salvador is always a tough team to play. I mean, credit to Hugo Perez, who had a fantastic game plan. I was talking with my buddy about this. Um fantastic game plan really really well coached team with good players you know everybody talks about oh it's only el salvador right well el salvador is running with a couple of really good mls players in alex roldan and eric zavaleta who was fantastic uh this this evening 
um, against a bunch of guys who are not used to playing that level, right? I mean, you, you talk about there. I, I feel like there is a. It's almost like a a, a weird performance drop off where like teams like Granada, and again, no no disrespect to Gren- the Grenadians, Gr- Gr- Grenadians, Grenadines. I don't. No disrespect to anybody from Granada. But they're a lower level team. They're supposed to get beat. They're supposed to get the snot beat out. But when you get the teams like El Salvador, like Jamaica, like Honduras away, you know, that's where you see this weird little drop off where we suddenly just can't perform. And then you go back to the bigger teams, you know, Wales, England, Iran in the World Cup, uh, Bosnia in a friendly that's when we start to play really well again. It's it's weird. It's almost it's like almost like a, a bunch of bogey games. So um only thing I'm disappointed with was our ability in front of goal. I mean, sixteen shots, a lot of them from really high quality areas, only four of them on target, a bunch of them put over the bar from close. It you know, we did enough to get the job done. We did we did enough to get the job done, which is what good teams need to do. However, when you talk about it, and we can talk about it a little bit, when you talk about, oh, look at all these big European players that we have in our team that are supposed to be world beaters playing against little old, and I, I use this in quotes as if I was a Euro snob, right? Little old El Salvador. We should be killing. And yet, we barely scrape by. So, your thoughts? It's it's a tough game. I mean, I'm paying. Paper, yes, you look at it and you say, we should absolutely smoke El Salvador. I mean, our guys are at the club level playing at some of the best teams in the world. And when you think about it that way, it's, it, you could picture taking a European big nation team and, and sticking them against El Salvador and saying like, okay, well, if we stuck Germany or England or Spain against El Salvador, you would think on paper, yeah, they're going to blow them out. And maybe that's the case. Maybe they do. But I feel like when you get into the reality of the game, it's a lot tougher. Um, it is going, it, it's a grind. El Salvador really seemed to buy in their, their uh, style of play and uh, play really well as a team rather than having the star power that like the U.S. has. So they, they back their system, play it well. They have good chemistry it's tough to break a team down and beat them by a lot when they have that going for them. I think, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to do against a Granada where the level of play is a lot lower, but for someone like El Salvador, yes, it seems easy on paper. I think the reality is it's just not as easy as it looks on paper. I love that point. Right. And, and we, we mentioned it a little bit earlier, right? Credit to Hugo Perez who had a fantastic game plan, but, Game plans only go as far as the players who put them into practice. And you are exactly right. This team bought into what they were doing. They were committed, and they nearly nicked the nicked the result out of this. Um, and I think this is where you see the lack of permanent head coach and permanent style from the USMNT hurting them. Because you're looking at a team now that, quite frankly, has not had a head coach since the World Cup. So they're they're bringing the same people in, maybe trying to learn a system or, or and, and integrate some new players. Right? You look at Zendejas, you look at Robinson getting back into the, the fray. But the coach maybe is trying to switch up something. You know, I, I think it was, um, was it, it might have been Ricardo Pepe mentioning like, oh, I've got a ton of freedom now in the attacking third when Greg was very, very structured. Well, when you get a ton of freedom, that's great. But you also need to learn when, when you're going to make a certain run or when you're going to make a, 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 a cut or a pass or a hold or a, a layoff, you know, there's so many different things that come with freedom that you still need to have chemistry with. And um, I think that's what you saw in this game against El Salvador, where a team that was committed and had the ability to, because I think Granada was probably committed as well, but didn't have that ability that they, uh, that this El Salvadorian team had. That's where you see the, the negative come into play. Yeah, I think we, I just I also think that we just didn't look as good today as we did against Granada. Like I just that's just flat out. And maybe I shouldn't say look because obviously we're going to look better against a team that's just not as good. But 
we just looked sloppy. Uh, the, the whole first 45 minutes, it was, you know, misplaced passes, poor first touches, and just nothing, like no creativity or chance creations for DK. I, I felt pretty bad for him because he just got nothing, like no today. And then as soon as he comes off, that's when Weston McKinney plays an absolute peach of a ball. So uh, I, I think... I think uh, El Salvador definitely deserves some credit for for playing a good system against us and playing really structured and well, but we kind of did it to ourselves a little bit too. I just don't think we were at our best. But you know, we say it all the time: teams that are not at their best but still find ways to win are really good teams. So I can't say anything other than happy thing about the window. Yeah, I'm, at the end of the day, right? I'm I'm happy with the result. I'm happy that the fact that we moved on. Uh, we're we're going to get into the semifinals of uh, the Nations League. We're going to compete for that that title. We're going to compete to defend that title. I love it. It does leave me with some worry, of course. However, I don't worry. I'm not going to worry that much, right? I've got if that's my biggest worry in life right now. Life's pretty good. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look at Concacaf standings right now for the Nations League. Just show you that it's you know the the quality of team may not necessarily be at the top level. It's not easy to get results against these teams. I think from what I saw standings, the only team that can match the amount of points that the U.S. got from their group was Panama, who could potentially get ten if they win their last game. So I mean, we're walking out of the uh, group stage for the Nations League with the most amount of points. I can't say I'm disappointed with that. <laughs> yep. We've also qualified for the Gold Cup after this as well. So the top two teams in each League A group qualify for the Gold Cup. So El Salvador will be joining us, Mexico, and I believe it was Jamaica as well, with, as you mentioned, Panama. Um... Nations League. Just double check here real quick before I start throwing. Yeah. Panama, Costa Rica, Canada, and Honduras. Yeah, there you go. So the same ones that you expect. Um, Mexico, Jamaica, Panama, Costa Rica, Canada, Honduras, and USA, El Salvador will all be going to the Gold Cup, which is exciting, right? So, um, you know, would I have liked to see a Martinique in there? You're damn right I would have. But that's okay. Um, kind of cool. I, I like to see what happens with the uh, the leagues below us too. Like next year, Cuba will be moving up, Haiti will be moving up, Nicaragua will be moving up, and and French Guiana look like they're going to be moving up too. So that'll be fun to to see different teams in there. Um, you know, just exciting, exciting different things, right? Um, but I do want to move on and ask you a question. We mentioned earlier. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everybody for listening. We had a <laughs> <laughs> We had we had right, mentioned before that it, to our count 90 different players across all the nations league, European, AFCON, uh, you know, friendlies in in Asia and then Tonka Calf Nations League. 90 players were called into their respective nations to represent their country. As you saw, this left MLS teams with quite the selection issue when it came to their starting 11. Are we more excited, or maybe are you more excited? We might have different opinions here. That our league is having all these players get called into the national team. It's, it's you know spreading our, our brand and, and getting our name out there. Or are we upset about it because our league doesn't stop during this time? And now we have to play through, you know, basically USL level talent on some teams, not all teams, but, you know, there are teams that are going to have to to suffer through this. I was wondering your thoughts on that. I can't see why we couldn't have a, have both. I mean, I am excited that we have, have lots of players going and representing their national teams, getting some more exposure as they kind of continue to build up and and continue to build their brand and 
get more attention on MLS. Like Tiago Amato going and scoring for Argentina is fantastic. You know, I think even if that gets a couple more people to be like, hey, who's this Tiago Amato guy? Let's look at him. Where's he playing? Oh, he's playing in MLS. That's great. Maybe I'll check him out. I think that's fantastic. But I also think that I I just don't love the fact that we are playing games during the international window, considering that, you know, at least from a Premier League perspective, they don't have any games uh, being played during the international window. I don't know why we wouldn't do something like that unless it's a scheduling thing. Uh, but yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I watched, I'm, I think you watched as well, the Galaxy Portland game and it just, it was a brutal game to watch. Let's just be honest. It was a, it was a rough game to watch. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if some of, some of that is definitely injuries. I know there's guys that are out on both sides with injuries and it's not just national duty, but you know, there are plenty of teams around the league. Like even the Atlanta game, I know Minnesota was missing a ton of teams, like just team missing five, maybe six starters. I, I mean, people want to pay to go watch the star players play. You know, if people want to go watch Atlanta, like if you're in the Columbus, or you want to go see Tiago Amato play. Here's your one chance. And now you can't because it's international dude and he's playing with Argentina. Since now, like I, I'm trying to find the tweet. I know someone put out the tweet of like the attendance numbers for this weekend with the international break, and some of the t- attendance numbers were just. I rem- Yeah, I remember that I mean, one too. The quakes were like twelve thousand. I think Houston was right around there, maybe thirteen thousand. It was just, it was bad. It was bad attendance, and it's not surprising. I mean, they're not gonna pay however much money it is to go watch all the backups play. Mm-hmm. No, com- completely agree. And I, I think the, I think we can be a little bit of both. I agree with you. Um, you know, I love the fact that we're getting our, our players out there. Miles Robinson looked fantastic today, um, which is very good to see. It's only going to raise his stock and, and help us out there. There was the, I, I believe it was OptiJack the website that does all the stat tracking that made some sort of tweet. Like this is the first, you know, when we played Granada, it was the first time we started an entire 11 without any MLS players and all the Euros. Now they're like, Oh my God, finally it's about time. But nobody recognized that it all started from where we were. So on that side, like this is a good opportunity to continue the pipeline, right? Throw these USL guys in there, see who can float and, and continue to develop them to do the next step. You know, I I think a ton of people, and this is why I've stopped trying to convince people now, because you're going to listen to these people who are like, oh, my goodness. You know, finally, we don't have any MLS players. But the second you tell them all those players were made in MLS, like, oh, well, it doesn't matter because now they play there in in Europe or Belgium or uh, uh, South America or whatever. Well, if you can't recognize the pipeline and what we're trying to do, then you're you're, there's no point in trying to save because you're not trying to learn. So I am a bit upset with the fact that we don't stop our league for international tournaments, but we are going to stop our league for a World Cup style knockout super tournament with Liga MX that is in the middle of the summer. I don't know. I feel like the, the, you know trying to phrase this correctly but i wonder i wonder if there's like a threshold at some point where if we hit 150 players in our league who are leaving to go to international duty is that when we decide to say okay it's time to stop right like where what is the limit before it's like okay we clearly can't do this again because it's it's just bad um and that'll be a that'll be an interesting conversation and and at what point how many teams do we need to get there, right? Is Are we going to hit 40 teams before we start saying, okay, let's let's now think about stopping for all of our international breaks like everybody else does? I don't know. I'm happy. I'm glad that we're getting our name out there because just raising the stock. Tiago Mata scoring for Argentina on the weekend, instant stock raise, right? And that's good for the league. Miles Robinson's performance, good for the league, right? Players who have that potential to make that move at some point, Performing well on the international stage is good for the league. 
the yeah the, the teams that come back and and have to now struggle in in MLS with very low level play because they're missing some of their big players not so good for the league but i guess it's a it's a pro and con thing right is in the grand scheme of things is Thiago Almada raising his stock by another 5 million worth the 900,000 in in revenue loss that you had from people not going to games that day i don't know i'm just making up numbers at this point right but you know there are people who make these decisions who are way above me and uh, are probably a little bit smarter than me not super super smarter than me but maybe a little bit um so i'm just a guy with a microphone who shares my ideas sometimes uh, they get paid to do this stuff now if they want to they can talk to high school level connor and me and we can give them a really good idea on how to make mls really good i don't remember it anymore but i know connor does no i don't remember it either I forgot it. we'll have to sit down and think about it again we've talked so much mls we've talked ourselves out of our idea Ham. um <laughs> so so we talk about this idea that we're lowering the level through USL talent on some of these teams because of how many players are getting taken into international camp. So my question then, now that you've seen the performance of some of these teams that were absolutely mutilated, I like that word, by the international window, do you think this sent a message out to the higher-ups, Daddy Don and his buddies, about changing some of our roster restrictions do we think this opens somebody's eyes to say you know what we're getting the exposure that we need to get we're getting the players over to competitions that they need to be in we're raising the level of our of our individual players it's time to start saying okay our t- our owners can our owners can pick out good players and spend money on good players. And it's going to come back and and be a good return. Is it time to start saying, okay, let's do it. At this point, there's been so many signs that they should do it. I can't imagine if they have no plans to do it. I can't imagine this is what pushes them over the edge. I mean, the amount of competitions that they have been getting you, uh, uh, MLS teams involved in and the amount of money that has been coming into the league in recent years. I just, I don't understand why they haven't changes to the salary cap to kind of be in proportion with that. And I can't imagine that an international break, even though, you know, obviously things would look a lot better if we had more money and had more depth on teams. I just can't imagine that this is like the straw that breaks the camel's back and gets them to loosen up on on salary rules. Even though I fully think that they should, because it's you know it's just ridiculous that it's been how many years now, and I feel like we still have generally the same roster rules as when as how we did back in like 2015 when NYC were bringing in all the retirement league players. So I just. I don't know what I don't know what it's gonna to take to get them to loosen them. And I, I know that they don't want to just like completely throw like all the salary cap rules out the window. Is I know that's a whole other conversation that could take us another like 45 minutes, but which we've had already, uh, by the way, multiple times. Yeah. But I just I I don't see it making a change for salary cap rules, unfortunately. So the way I look at this is MLS is held by a a CBA, right? They can't just go changing rules willy-nilly. They've got an agreement that says every year we're going to increase GAM, TAM, YAM, BAM, WAM, whatever, by X amount until we hit the the deadline for what we've agreed upon now, and then we'll renegotiate. So my, my question is, I don't know when it expires. I thought it was relatively soon. I thought it might have been 2024. Double check here. MLS CB, uh, MLS CBA expiration. MLS will increase player spending, blah, 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 as defined in CBA. Uh, 2027. 
they, 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 rev- they renewed it in 2020, and then it went all the way through 2027. So we've got a while to go before it happens, but here's what the outlook looks like right now. By 2027, so right now we're in 2023, the salary budget's $5.2 million. You get $1.9 million a GAM, $2.72 million a TAM, and available spend on your roster um, is just under $10 million. And you can go over those figures by using designated players and three players through the league's U22 initiative. So you can spend like transfer fee up to that much. By 2027, the salary budget will be $7 million. Just a little bit over that. You will more than double your GAM in $3.9 million. TAM will go down to $2.2 million. And the available roster spend will go up by four million to thirteen. So they'll have player uh, spending increases as well. So um, twelve point five percent of the incremental media revenue will uh, go into being available to be spent. Twenty five percent of that will be twenty five, twenty six, and twenty seven seasons. So there are like it is going to get better. No doubt about it. And I think that's why people don't understand this is because they don't know these figures, which I didn't know until I just looked them up. Like you're looking at a, at a, an increase of $4 million on your roster spending, not including designated players. That right there is, is your middle, middle of the pack group, right? The question is, will the market, the world football market, correlate with this increase right so you've seen some of the the figures for the best players in the world go skyrocketing over the last what three years probably it's just been straight to the moon um that has made the average player way more expensive than they should be so it, it, that is my my question here. I don't, I don't. I agree with you. I don't think it'll change. But my question is: Come twenty twenty seven, is that when we see it happen? Is that when we see the wheels come off and say, "Let's do this"? And that's kind of where I'm, I'm feeling. You know what? Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe that's that's where we wait and we say, "Okay, when we renegotiate, salary budget's going to go up to ten million. Gam and Tam are going to go away. Available roster spend jumps to twenty. And we just say go at it. Uh, I just that just feels like such a long time to get to that point. I mean, I know it's growing. Um, it's it's it's. I just looked up the numbers from 2015 because I was curious to see how it compared. And the the salary was 3.5 million. So I mean, it's gone up since that point. But I just the amount of money that the league is collecting in transfer fees compared to where you were in 15. I'm looking at a list right now of top sales for MLS and the top 25 sales, only two of them came in 2015 or earlier. It was, it was Miazga to Chelsea for like 4.6. And that was the 25th highest. And it was Josie to VRL for about seven million. Where did the where rest did of them? The, where did both are, those guys come from? Oh, is that the, that's not the agenda we're talking about, right? That now. is absolutely the agenda. But, Red Bull makes the world takes. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> uh, but the rest of the list, every 2018 or later, is when these sales came from. And I mean, we're talking. We're talking massive numbers compared to that. Almiron went for 24. Uh, Duran barely, I feel like barely league. He went for almost 17 million. Pepe went for 16 million after one season here. Even PT went for 16 million. I mean, we know Almada is going to go for crazy, ridiculous money. I bet Renner goes for very good money as well. I just, the proportion of money that the league is in versus how quickly the salary cap is growing, I, I, I almost am worried that it's going to be a handicap in terms of us being able to continue this wave of 
building up players, sending them on. Because I feel like the momentum is there right now. I, I really wish we could build on it more to really capitalize on it and go get like a bunch more Tiago Almada type players. I think it would be fantastic if we have like really good scouting in South America and we beat the European teams to signing the next Tiago Almada. And then we can build them up and get the for selling them onto Europe. So I I'm I'm hoping that by 2027 we can really have strong changes in the salary cap but I, i'm just worried that the growth in terms of change in salary cap is just too slow the amount of money that the league is bringing in from transfers so as you were talking i had a whole bunch of things jump into my head so i'm going to try and say them without forgetting them because i didn't write them down because i'm not bright 2027 is when the cba ends right 2026 mm-hmm. we have the fifa world cup happening in our backyard you have to assume that's going to do something to the way that this is going to going to pan out and i'm that's what i'm kind of cautiously optimistic about is you're going to see a ton of top level players in the united states playing football every single day fans are going to get excited they're going to they're going to pick teams they're going to say oh man this guy's from over here whatever and then tw- Come 2027, they've got a big increase in available roster spend to say, hey, let's do it. And then 2028, when they when they ratify the CBA, open it up and, and get going. Flip side. I'm questioning if the reason that it's growing so slowly is to appease the four old as dirt owners who are afraid to actually spend money in this league. We know who they are. We won't attack them we won't address them but there's there is something to be said about the risk versus reward of investing in this league this league was and and we we have had this conversation before but this league was not started in 1800 with a bunch of people who played for their club and just wanted to play against each other this league started because somebody put a lot of money into it which means that person took on the risk of what this league was and has a lot more power than somebody who bought in two years ago. That being said, I think we're getting to a point we are getting to overpower them, which is pretty good because eventually they're going to have to fold and either sell their team or, or actually buy into it. But I'm, that's kind of where I see the reason for this slow, slow increase is because the the people who have been here for 27 years are not used to things going the way they are. They don't know what the global market is like. They don't know how to invest in things, and they're going to lose money if they do. My last I note. Not, I, oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Finish your notes before you forget them. Uh-oh. I think I might have forgotten. <laughs> go go <laughs> ahead. Go ahead and speak, and I will, uh, I will think. I was just going to say, I, I think... I think you're right in that it, maybe it is catering to the few owners that are just really slow on the ball, ball in terms of spending. But God, I, I hate that so much. I'm just, I'm so sick of seeing teams like RSL or Vancouver, or San Jose that just have zero ambitious, zero, sorry, zero ambition to spend and try and be competitive in this league. I mean, I'm I'm looking up a, a list of t- purchases in the league, uh, and I am on page three, 75 players in, yet to see a single RSL player. Hey, I you mean, better you better give Vancouver credit. They're top five. Vancouver's Vancouver's not top five. They used to be. They're not even top 25. No shot. Where's Chow Seth, Alexander? I mean, I don't know how accurate. Where's Chow Alexander? He was 13 he... Was he? Absolutely. I remember it being a big deal. Because with that, we had this conversation when it happened. Saying that they never spend, and now they're spending $13 million. And that's why it's the biggest joke in the world, because he's played like four times. This says 3.6 for Chow Alexander. No. No shot. You keep you keep 3.6 3.6 3. 
3.6 euros. You can look at it if you want. But yeah, you're in mean, transfer market. Yeah, I don't think I, I saw San Jose in here either. I mean, I'm 75 players deep, and the teams I consistently see at the top it's like NYC, Austin, LAFC, Atlanta, FC. It's like it's these new teams that come in. They're willing to spend money. They're willing to splash the cash. Try. I don't care if they fail. Just try, but at least try and go bring somebody in. LA Galaxy did this in 2010, and it completely changed the league. They spent the money. They brought in big name players, Keen Beckham. They had Landon Donovan, and it absolutely paid off. But I would rather see a team try and fail than just cater and protect the teams like RSL or I don't want to. I don't want to say a team, and then they end up having players in here. <laughs> but like I'll just say an RSL or maybe like a Vancouver or potentially like a maybe Chicago. I don't know if I saw any really. Sh- oh, Chicago had Shakiri. And OK, Chicago has a couple players mm-hmm. in the uh, top 50. But you know what I'm saying? I didn't see any San Jose, no RSL. Like why do and I, I'm, I know that this conversation is going right down the route of well, then just introduce pro rel so that they get punished for this. But I was going to ask we, if I was going to ask if we wanted I'm to I'm not start diving that. down that conversation. <laughs> I'm not diving down that conversation because it's 1030 already. But um, I do wish we had a way to punish it without, you know, risking just folding teams in the league because we want to introduce pro rel and nobody wants to go watch RSL play or, or San Jose play in the second division with when they are they're in the top division and they can only pull like 12,000 fans. Um 12,000 yeah, fans I, in I the really second wish, division would be great though. I think if you just yeah, 12 it probably would be, but they wouldn't have 12,000 fans in the second division. Um but yeah, I think if you really if you loosen the cap, the the salary cap and you made it so that you reward the teams like Atlanta or LAFC who are willing to go and end, you will see the teams like RSL, San Jose, or whoever, get punished not spending. I think that is, in my opinion, the best way to do it without just introducing pro rel and potentially just having teams fold. I don't know if you, I, I imagine you were looking into Chow Alexander. I was. It didn't. It, it, it wasn't up there. I, me- I messed. I don't know what it was, but I messed it up. Uh, it was. You know what it might have been? It might have been one of their like top ever signings, and that's where I got it confused with. Here's the it issue. Was. I, I think it was like second behind Cavallini. Yeah, that sounds about right. That's probably right. Anyways, the, the, the issue that comes with the way the league is run is not there's no punishment for, you know, no pro rel if you lose, right? Because NFL, MLB, NBA, none of them are pro rel and they're totally fine. The issue with it is that the quality of player that comes out of the MLS Super Draft is not nearly at the quality of player that comes out of the NFL Draft, the NBA Draft, MLB Draft. It's just not. So that's where there's there's no risk or reward for finishing in last, which is why teams will have to dig deep into their youth academy to find success. And this brings me back to the point that I had forgotten. You had mentioned, you know, the the salary cap is increasing at a rate that is not... Um, that doesn't coincide with the increase in in revenue from player sales. I would almost, I, I wouldn't bet it because I'm not a betting man. But if I was, I'd probably put a decent little little prop bet on the idea that there is an unwritten agreement between all of the owners that we are going to slowly increase what we do but to ensure that the league has longevity and to ensure that the league can be sustainable over the next five to seven years we need to heavily invest reinvest what we use for homegrown players which is why now that if you sell a homegrown player you keep all of the money instead of going 50 50 or 30 you know whatever Because now you feed that back in, you develop more players, you develop football around the area, you develop football for the nation, and we've created a sustainable system. At some point, that becomes unnecessary and redundant. 
right now, I don't believe that it is because we are priding ourselves and parading ourselves out like a a Netherlands or an Eredivisie type league. We are going to develop players. We are going to sell them. We'll buy low, sell high, or we will develop from within and sell for 100% profit which is a great way to get the the stock of your league up to get people still looking at your league as okay I can go there and it's not the end of my career which is not the case it was never a retirement league but because people had a negative outlook on it we weren't sending people out it it had that feel so I believe that until 2027, I think that you're going to see way more homegrown to Europe. But I think in 2027, and this I don't know if it's a hope or a thought, because it could be a little bit of both. I think that's when we start our push to be a league of competition between your top five in Europe, both monetarily and then the way that we play. Because I think what's happening is what we're going to pl- Again, this is my brain now going mega, right? You're going to develop football at a young age for a lot of people. This just started a couple of years ago. So that's why you're seeing the 17-year-olds who started at age 12 start to make these big moves. But now you're doing it at even younger ages, 7, 8, 9. You're teaching football methodology. You're teaching club ideology. You're teaching all of these things that we learn in our coaching classes at very, very young ages, so they understand the game, not just the physical attributes to do it. By creating that network of players that are able to understand the game and physically perform it, you're creating a stronger floor for what we are producing out of our academy. Then in 2027, if we open up our spending and start bringing people in, coaches and players, by the way, But if you start bringing in the best of the best or at least one of the best of the best for each team, now your ceiling gets really high, too. So it used to be the ceiling was really high. The floor was really low and there was a whole bunch of empty space in between. Right now, we're trying to basically close that gap and create a more dense. Attractive leap, for lack of a better term, people are there. We're trying to make it so that people will either. I hear this thing a lot where nobody grows up wanting to play for New York Red Bulls. Nobody grows up wanting to play for Atlanta United. Everybody grows up wanting to play for Manchester United or or whatever. And I think that's what they're trying to change with this whole mindset of creating systems in tons of cities where people are looking up every week and saying, I want to go to that game. You know, I'm a ball. I think it was John Tolkien's story, right? Like, I was a ball boy at, at age eight for Red Bull. I remember going to every single game all the time. And now, I, now I'm living my dream of being on that field, right? That wasn't the case 10 years ago. So they're trying to create this feeling of, okay, people want to play here. So they're going to try and, and become the best that they can be. So they can get into that first team. And then we're going to supplement it with, with these big name, name players. We're going to create a dense league that, has a, a, a really good youth base and really good in their prime players, but we have to be patient to get there because if we're not patient to get there, the whole thing falls apart because our, our, our floor isn't on a good foundation and our ceiling has holes, right? If we don't patch it up and we don't put the good foundation down, we don't get a successful product. And this is my, this is my business brain going off, which I don't have, by the way, I'm an engineer. So, me and Daddy Don, we're on the same page. I get what he's trying to do. I'm here for you, my guy. Jump on the pod sometime. Let's chat your strategy. Let's do this. I I think a good point to mention that they seem to be building from the ground up in terms of like supporting academies and getting more guys developed and, and moved on. And I mean, you could see it just in, in the list of players that have moved on. I see a number of guys here that were like academy guys, you know, like, Brendan Aronson, Alfonso Davies, Gaga Slanina, um, Brian Reynolds, Kevin Paredes. Like the list goes on and on and on. Uh, so I, I do, I have a kind of a question for you, but I wanted to mention another point before I jump into that. So then you can answer it while it's still on topic. Okay. I feel okay. like, I feel like to your point on 
making MLS a more of, I guess I'll say more of a destination. So, you know, talking about the guys who want to like, you know, look up to playing for an MLS side. I just, I can't see that being the case while MLS continues to be a feeder league to other leagues. I just feel like you can definitely have, like it can be a dream to make it to the MLS level, but I feel like it's step to get to like the ultimate goal because we continue to send players to other countries where presumably you're sending it to better leagues and your reputation and prestige. I feel like those teams are going to be the teams that they ultimately want to get to. So, and I'm not saying that this is necessarily the case for Tolkien because I, I don't I don't know John himself, but I would imagine it's definitely like a goal for him to get to Red Bull, considering especially you know he grew up as a ball boy. So to get to Red Bull, I think is definitely a dream. But I would also imagine that he has aspirations beyond Red Bull, and to probably to another level, which might be like that dream that you were talking about of people growing up being like, I want to play for Manchester United. I want to play for Barcelona. He's an Everton. Cause man, I, so. I see that as like, okay. So Everton for him in that case, like, I think that's their end goal. Whereas the dream of playing for Red Bull feels like a step as opposed to like at the top of the staircase. Um, but the question I wanted to give you, hold on, let me, let me was, let me, is, does it build off of that? Cause I do have a comment on that. No, it's different. Okay. Well, I, I agree with you that right now it's a step. However, 10 years ago, the step was, we, we just did the story on Pro 40, right? If you haven't, or actually we're doing the story on Pro 40. Yeah, it won't be out by this time. Oh, a, 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 week from, a week from when this goes out, I think. So when you listen to yeah. it, you're going to hear the story of how people look down on this, this Pro 40 team as a demotion, right? 10 years ago, Everybody dreamed of playing in Europe because that's where all the big players were. That's where all the stars were. That's where all the media attention was. MLS was spoken poorly about, which meant that they saw it as a, a stepping stone for one big thing and one big thing only. Right now, I think that the end goal is still there. However, I don't believe that people look at playing in MLS as a, as a youth academy product as like a, oh, I'm only here for as long as somebody calls my name to go overseas and then I'm gone. You look at, I'm trying to think of a, a good example here. I mean, I don't have any anything for this, right? But Jesus Ferreira, first homegrown designated player in league history. My guess is after the seasons he's had, he had people in Europe calling his name. But he chose to stay and take the DP tag in, in, in Dallas. Is that a first of its kind? Maybe. I don't know. I, I haven't done that much research into it. But my guess is that is going to become more normal. Where if a team in Bel Belgium's you know bottom half of Belgian league comes calling with a $3 million price tag and some other team says, hey, no, we want you to stick around. We're going to pay you X amount of money. And we're going to also bring in, you know, this other guy who's going to be a world beat. You guys are going to get together and be really, really good. I think more people will choose to stay here by the time 2027 comes around. I'm, I'm right now. I think it's still a jumping point because that's what we're trying to do. But I think by the time we get all this stuff together, I think people are going to see this as a, you know, I don't mind being. Here. That's just me. Yeah. No, I think that I think that's a great point. I mean, I'm looking at the list of players that we have sold and and I'm saying to myself, like, just looking at the top 25, if we, we managed to keep even 10 of these guys while they were still at their prime, like when they were getting sold off, like if you managed to hold on to a Mark McKinney, a Matt Miazga when he, back in like 2015, um, if you got to hold on to Chris Richards and built him up a bit more. Even Diego Rossi. I mean, we only they sold Diego Rossi to Turkey. Like, I don't see the Turkish League being that much farther ahead of MLS. If you can hold on to these as a few more of them, even like Jordi Mihailovic, and give teams the ability to spend money and keep them here, 
like a Jesus Ferreira. I think that's a great example. And continue to find more Jesus Ferreras to build around him. Now we're building the level of the teams and building the level of the league and starting to take that next step where we can prove the league, improve the teams, improve the talent, and then ultimately that improve people's desire to come play in the league and see this as the top of the staircase. So correct. And and I, that's I do think I feel like we're on the same I think we're on the same page. Yeah. It's just not we're not saying the exact same words. It's basically right, right. And I and I think I think to end that to end that before you go to your your question, I think that is what this increase in spending ability is going to do over the next four years. Is it going to give you that ap- ability to say, okay, this guy wants to go that's fine, but I can also throw a bag at him and see if it'll stay. Because at the end of the day, and I know people will complain about this all the time, but at the end of the day, players go to leagues for one thing and one thing only. Money. If a team throws a bag at you, you are going. It's plain and simple. You know, when when Insigne and, and Bernadeschi go to Toronto, it's, oh, they're just going there to, to get a bunch of money and, and retire. Sure. Messi went to PSG for what reason? Because he wanted a new challenge after winning it? No. Because PSG threw a bag at him and said, we're going to put a, a wonder team around. You're going to win everything in the world. And then he ended up not winning everything in the world. Why did Ronaldo go to, to Saudi Arabia? Money. Why did Holland go to, to City over uh, probably Bayern Munich was probably in there, I'm sure. Money, right? Everybody goes somewhere for money. Very rarely... This is my fa- my favorite example of that is Alex Song going to Barcelona. I'm sure you've seen this story before. Alex Song went to Barcelona um, as a as a replacement for whoever they maybe maybe Yaya Torre when he left. It was like the the next step up. They told him, "Hey, you're not going to play for four years until we can get you developed the way you want to go." And he said directly to the camera. I don't give a damn if I play ever again. You're giving me a million dollars and change a season. I'll sit on the bench all day long if you're going to give me a million dollars a season. I mean, how much more? You're, you're talking about a guy going to Barcelona who everybody talks about, oh, they go for the, the heritage or the, the, the history. or No, people go there because Barcelona throw Monopoly money at them and then they get all upset when they don't actually have money to pay. Them. Sorry, now I'm going off on a tangent. Please ask me your question. <laughs> just one minute on that i do think that the heritage does probably play some point in it because i would imagine once you have a bunch of clubs that just have ridiculous endless amounts of money to throw at you there's got to be some kind of differentiator at the point uh and i'm sure it differs depending on each player like in holland's situation i think he was just like a perfect fit for city and it's not to say that Someone like Madrid or PSG couldn't throw the same amount of money at him as Man City did. But I think some of it is, you know, the the current team situation and maybe some of it is the the uh, the background of the club. Like when Hazard left to go to Madrid, like he he's, he could easily got that money from another team, hell, even Chelsea. But he went to Madrid because he wanted to play for Madrid. That was like his dream club, dream club to play for. So. I think prestige plays some part in it, but I do think money is like eighty five percent of the driver. Correct. So, so what I'll say is, right? Um, why, why did why did Mbappe not go to Real Madrid when they came knocking and stay at PSG? Because they literally gave him ownership of the club. I mean, yeah, of course, right? Like, yeah. like at the end of yeah. the day, at the end of the day, yes, there there might if if a top four team historically, Man United, Man City, Arsenal, Real Madrid, Barcelona. Uh, PSG, I'll say um, Monaco. I don't know where they are anymore. And then go to go to go to Italy and say uh, Milan, Inter, Juve, Napoli. Any of those clubs come calling for a player in MLS? Yeah, they're probably going to jump because they grew up all their life to do there. If you're telling me a club from Belgium or German second division is coming calling for a player in MLS? Nobody's going there because of heritage and, and, and history. They're going there because the Europeans are paying them three times as much to do the same job. 
And that's the end of the day. And that's where you're going to see as we continue to raise our, our ceiling in terms of money, you're going to see more and more people choose to stay. We're going to raise the floor of, of, our, of our teams while also allowing more people to come in with bigger and better um, price tags. And again, we are moving in the right direction, no doubt. But um, to, to wrap this up, finish up with your question. Yes. So my question now that we are like way off the tangent from where, <laughs> where the question off the related tangent. to. I wouldn't say off the tangent. I'd say we were continuing. Well, you don't even know what my question is about. You oh, your, know oh your about. question is off the tangent. Okay. I thought I thought you yeah, had like no, our entire our, our entire 25 minute conversation no, no, no. was off tangent. No, 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 no. Um my question to you, um, and this relates to us building up the kids through the academy and selling them up onto your do you, like how much of that do you think is actually bringing attention to MLS versus it's just good for like our national team to have these guys getting more competition, better style of play. If you look at a Mark McKenzie sale, like how much of that is really bring to light what MLS is capable capable of producing and selling on, or like a Jean Lubusio to Venezia. Like I, I don't think people in Europe are seeing those moves and being like, MLS is like producing talent. Like let's keep an eye on it. Like we don't have to watch the games. Okay, like, hey, let's keep an eye on the guys that are moving there. Versus like, in my opinion, it just feels like these moves aren't necessarily for the attention of MLS, but more so good for the national team in terms of getting competition for for spots. I think. I agree with you. I don't think that it's doing a ton for international viewership. I would agree with you on that. That is where the players coming from, you know, the Insigne, the Gareth Bale, the, the Zlatan, the players that are coming over to play here, that's what's bringing the eyes to the league. The players that we are producing and selling over and you know performing at the national team level might be keeping them. But I don't think the sale of players is increasing our viewership in terms of international uh, fans. However, what I will say is that it is increasing the number of eyes from both talent scouts, right? Te you know, scouts for teams that are looking for players, which is good, but it also is looking at agents, right? Agents and scouts work together, I'm assuming, relatively closely saying, hey, you know, my guy wants to make a jump to your team. Clearly, he's not at that level. Where should he go where you're going to keep an eye on him? If they say that we're pulling seven players a year at, ML at MLS, that's where you're going, man. And that's, that's easy. So I wouldn't, I'd, I'd say it's, it's less about getting eyes on the league as a, as a bunch of fans, but growing the popularity of the league amongst the players. And when it becomes a choice for players, when players are choosing to come here, whether it be to stay forever or to jump, because it could be both, that's when people are going to start realizing, okay, there, there's a reason people are going. Right? And, and again, you'll have your Euro snobs that make it whatever reason they want without it actually being the real reason. But the people who understand the league, the people who follow it will understand what it's all. Okay, I think that's fair. It's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I really like the point on, you know, the the scouts and the agents working together. I think definitely more agents, even from like South America, have realized that like this really good gateway at this point to getting players into Europe. Like obviously, you know, Europe scouts. Argentina, Brazil, South America in general directly. But I think them moving to MLS definitely has helped a lot too. I mean, we definitely need to do more sales for players from South Africa. I mean, so, sorry, South America. Because <laughs> um, we just, we really, honestly, we've spent a lot of money on bringing in big name players. We haven't sold a lot to Europe yet. I see Duran, I see Almiron, and I think that's about it for the top 25. So I think there's still work to be done. 
but uh yeah i mean i think it's it's definitely moving in the right direction yeah and, and at the end of the day right it's not a secret that argent you know south americans and europeans play the game better than us for the style that is desired in europe two different games between here and in Europe or here and in South America. That's not a secret. People understand that. So there's there's this choice, and, and now I put on my coaching hat and think about if we want to develop players that are going to make an impact at these big European teams, we have to coach them like a European setup. And that's where we find our issue, is the fact that here you can look at a team like Red Bull, which will played a game this weekend with 27% possession. They didn't even make an attempt to keep the ball. They just knocked it long and tried to win the second, which is not, I mean, it's great for championship level teams because that's how the championship runs. But the Premier Leagues of big top teams are not playing that way. They want players to understand the game. They want them to understand all four phases. They want them to understand all this, this, you know, high level tactical knowledge which is why i think we're getting there because if you look at the other non red bull teams in the league it looks brilliant sometimes there is some really really good play going on in this league one because we're bringing in the players who know how to do it but again we're taking that floor and we're teaching them at a young age what it means to be tactically aware in, in the sense of football what it means to play as a number 6 what it means to play as a number 7 or an 11 Right, what it means to be an inverted winger or a, a, a playmaking number 10 or how to find the split pass when we want it or how to zigzag it out of the back instead of just dump it long. All these little things are creating stepping stones for us to get to that level. And when we combine the, the, the American talent that we're bringing up with the international youth that have learned it in a, in a, in a different sense and the other international higher level players that have done it at the high level for a while you're creating a better product on the field and that's where we are going with this it's it's less i think the 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 worry is less about if we are going to get there and the worry is about and that is the big question mark and i think 2026 the world cup is going to have a big impact on that but the world cup and the impact on the footballing nature of this country is a completely other episode that we can talk for hours i think we should wrap it up I feel you, like know we, you know what we need to do we need to write a book you and i we need to write a book oh god we're gonna do that we're gonna write so we're gonna actually we're gonna write two books we're gonna write one book recapping all of the best things about mls history which we are actually doing a series on right now if you haven't seen it go check it out uh, anywhere you get your podcasts or on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, it's all over the place. You can go check it out. The second book we're going to write is the development of football in America, basically the way we just described it, by raising the, ce- the floor, by solidifying the ceiling, and making everything else in between nice and pretty. We're going to be best-selling authors, Connor. Are you excited? stoked <laughs> ah, nice uh all right thanks everybody for for watching uh if you're excited for our book or you just want to go follow us next time we get a, an episode out there make sure you follow us wherever you get your podcasts um leave us a like comment subscribe you know whatever you can do to follow podcasts uh, share it with your buddies share it with your family share it with people you hate share it with your dog i don't care share it with people because we love talking this stuff um Make sure you follow us on social media too. We like to post clips from here. So if you don't feel like listening to me ramble on for 30 minutes about the, uh, the development of football in America from a coaching standpoint, you can just go look at other clips and that's fun too. Um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok were there all the time. Uh, it's tons of fun. And then um, if you are excited for a book, leave us a comment wherever you're watching this clip or episode or video saying author Connor. Because that's what he's going to be. He's going to be an author. It's going to be great. Um, Connor, do you have anything to say about your future book or anything else on the episode or we just call it? 
I'm very excited for my future career pivot. <laughs> this will get you out of the uh, the accounting world for good. I can't wait. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like I said, follow us wherever you get your podcast, and we will see you next time on the next episode of the Designated Players Podcast. See ya.